Graham Phillips, welcome back to the program. Well, very great to be back on again, Russell. Thank you very much. Graham Phillips is a historical detective in pursuit of lost relics and the hidden truths buried in the past. Whether you agree with his conclusions or not, Graham Phillips' findings are always original, thought-provoking, and his books are sensational. Books such as The Shakespeare Conspiracy, The Templars and the Ark of the Covenant, Merlin and the Discovery of Avalon in the New World, and his latest, The Lost Tomb of King Arthur. In today's show, Graham will guide us through his search for Camelot, the Isle of Avalon, Excalibur, and what could very likely be the grave of the real King Arthur himself. To learn more about Graham Phillips, visit grahamphillips.net. Graham, much of the Arthurian legend is fiction, and much of it is fact. So let's start with the obvious question. Was King Arthur a real person? King Arthur, the story we know about him today, was pretty much written in the Middle Ages. That's from around about a thousand years ago, over the next few hundred years. And the story tells of this man who was a king of Britain, that he had made a round table at his wonderful castle of Camelot, that he fought dragons, that he rescued damsels in distress, and he was a knight in shining armour. Now, that figure clearly did not exist, not historically. But a good few hundred years before these Arthurian romances were composed, there are historical records that refer to a warrior called Arthur. Now, the first of the Arthurian romantic stories was written around about 1135, by a man called Geoffrey of Monmouth. But 300 years before that, around the year 830, a British monk by the name of Nennius wrote a history of Britain in which he records that Arthur was an historical warlord who united the various British kingdoms uh, to repel the invading Anglo-Saxons who had come to invade this country from Germany. And it refers to him in a, met a completely matter of fact way without any kind of myths and legends. It just tells us that he fought a series of very successful battles against the Anglo-Saxons. He was regarded by the native Britons as a great hero and that he lived sometime around the year 500 AD. And the matter of fact way in which Nennius describes Arthur as simply a warrior uniting the Britons without any kind of um, embellishment or elaboration suggests very strongly that at that time, Arthur was considered to have been an historical figure. Was Nennius a historian? Because now if you look at Geoffrey of Monmouth, he wrote about all these mythologies and things that couldn't possibly be true, but he was writing them as though they were factual. Yeah, what happened is that the background to when Arthur's historical time is supposed to be is that this country, Britain, was ruled by the, Ang uh, ruled by the Romans until uh, 410 AD. The Roman Empire was collapsing, the Roman legions left, and Britain pretty much fell apart, divided into a lot of separate feuding kingdoms. And by the time Arthur is said to appear on the scene, around 500 AD, Britain is very much into the so-called Dark Ages, the period when there is no law and order. And it is because of this that the Anglo-Saxons, who originally came from Germany, were able to start to invade Britain. And Arthur is said to have been the person who united the country to repel this invasion. Now, about 50 years after the time that Arthur is said to have lived, we know from both archaeological record and from the historical records of the Anglo-Saxons themselves that they then started to completely overrun the country. Arthur's, Arthur or whoever it was around about the year 500 who united the Britons seems to have given a sort breathing space. But after they probably died, then the Anglo-Saxons were on the move again. Now, that meant that a whole of what's now England became an Anglo-Saxon country until the Normans from France invaded Britain in 1066. And the kings who ruled here after that were of French descent, 
Now, the king on the throne of England at the time that Geoffrey of Monmouth wrote in the 1100s wanted to uh, basically prove that he had a legitimate right to rule the country, that he was descended from royalty, not from a bunch of warriors from northern France. And he, they, they, they couldn't say that the, the, the Normans who ruled Britain couldn't say that they were descended from the Anglo-Saxon kings. But they could make a case that they were descended from kings of Britain who had ruled here before the Anglo-Saxons invaded. Now, one of these was the mythical or semi-mythical King Arthur, whom various things had been written about, but not in any great detail. So the king asked Geoffrey of Monmouth, he said to him, put together a, a history of Britain and really make as much as you can out of Arthur, because I believe I am descended from him. And he had some truth. There was some truth in this because a lot of the Britons, once the Anglo-Saxons had, in, had invaded, fled to northern France. So he could make a case that he was descended from this man, Arthur. But nothing was hardly known about him. So he asked Geoffrey of Monmouth to find out. And Geoffrey of Monmouth managed to find various uh, bits and pieces in old British uh, historical records. But his job was specifically to make Arthur into this, you know, larger than life character. And so he greatly embellished the story of Arthur with pretty much his own imagination. In other words, King Arthur was used as a kind of medieval propaganda exercise to uh, create this figure upon whom the British kings could say they were they, you know, they were descended from this great king who was greater than any of the Anglo-Saxons. So that's why the story of Arthur, as we now know it, came about. So much like. Uh, Josephus or Goebbels, just a propaganda agent, uh, was Geoffrey of Monmouth. Geoffrey of Monmouth was the Joseph Goebbels of his day. From where did King Arthur rule? Uh, the legends speak of Camelot, but clearly a, such a place never existed. Well, early, all the early stories, including that written by Geoffrey of Monmouth, refer to uh, Arthur uh, ruling from a very important city in Britain. It was the capital of Britain at the time he was said to have lived, around 500 AD. But strangely, the first, people started following Geoffrey of Monmouth's lead and either found other historical material to add to it or made up their own additions to the story. And gradually, throughout the 1100s, the story of King Arthur became more elaborated. Uh, but they all refer to this wonderful cities said to have ruled from but none of the early legends actually named this city it seemed that it had been forgotten during the dark ages and it wasn't until almost the year 1200 that a poet a french speaking poet called chrétien de Troyes, came up with the name camelot simply as a means to rhyme with the word lancelot he in other words that wasn't the name of the place originally no one knew knew what it was called so if one was to say, OK, if we're looking for a historical Arthur, let's look for a place called Camelot. Well, there isn't such a place. So what we've got to try and do, if we're going to try and pinpoint upon whom the legend of Arthur was based, we've got to find out what was the capital of Britain at the time Arthur is said to have ruled in 500 or thereabouts. Now, during Roman times, Britain had had four major cities, London, Lincoln, um, York, which are all on the east side of the country, and a place called Viraconium, which is in the centre of the country. Now, all the eastern cities had been overrun by the Anglo-Saxons, which left Viraconium in the centre of England as pretty much the capital of Britain, as it was at the time Arthur was around. Now, this Roman city, unlike, shall we say, the Roman ruins of London, which are underneath modern office blocks and streets, Viraconium never became a city after the Dark Ages. So the Roman ruins still survive in open countryside. You can still see them today, the foundation stones and the some of the walls of the ancient Roman city. And so archaeologists have been able to do a lot of excavation there, which they've been, un been unable to do in many other Roman cities. And they have discovered that whereas other Roman towns were being abandoned after the legions left for more defensible hill fortifications, Viraconium was not only still occupied, but massively refortified. And archaeologists say that 
the only reason this could have happened is because somebody, some very important local chieftain, must have had the power and the the authority and the the means to have uh, defended the city in this way and done all this new construction. And what's so incredible is that right in the centre of this city, they discovered that a completely Roman style palace had been re, uh, had been built in the centre of the city. And they believe that it must have been the palace of a very important post Roman warlord, possibly somebody who united the Britons at the very time that archaeology tells us that the Anglo-Saxons were being pushed back. And it's also the very time that Arthur is said to have done just that. So the place to look if we're trying to find an historical Arthur is the city of Viriconium, which is in the centre of Britain, just outside a modern town called Shrewsbury. In our 2013 interview, The Real Merlin and the Discovery of Avalon in the New World, you talked about a bear king named Owen Fant Gwyn. Was he the man we now refer to as King Arthur? Yes, I believe he was. And the reason for it is this. Um, but going by the archaeological evidence suggesting that if there was a King Arthur, whoever it was who united Britons in the early, um, around 500 AD, this person seems to have ruled from Viriconium. And we do have the record surviving to tell us who actually ruled from here at that time. In the British Library, there is a document refer that's known as the Annals Cambrai, which means the Welsh Annals, which refers not only to kings of Wales, but as for Britain as a whole throughout the Dark Ages. And it refers, there's a number of uh, genealogies, family trees that tell us who ruled where and when. And the person who ruled at Viriconium at the time Arthur is said to have ruled was called Owen Than Gwyn. Now, this man, Owen, you're thinking I, I, when I first discovered this, I thought, well, OK, maybe I found the man who united the Britons at the time Arthur is said to have done it. But he wasn't called Arthur. That was until I found in the writings, there's very few writings have survived from that period. The reason is that the country had fallen into a complete state of chaos. Very few records were kept and very few have survived. But one particular writing that did survive was by another British monk called Gildas, who actually wrote within living memory of the period Arthur is supposed to have lived. He wrote in around about 545. And what he wrote, he tells us about, he writes about this man, Owen, but he refers to him also as his, as a battle name. And he calls him um, the bear. And the, the reason for this is many British kings at that time were given honorary names of animals that in some way represented their prowess, like a fox, for example, if you were cunning. And this man, Owen, was referred to as the bear. Now, Gildas writes in Latin, so he calls him Ursus, Latin for bear. But if you take the name, the word bear, and translate it into Brythonic, which was the language spoken by the Britons at the time, the word for a bear is Arth, A-R-T-H, and it's still preserved in modern Welsh today. So what I found, find really amazing is that Arthur is said to have ruled for the most powerful city in the country around 500 AD. The most powerful city in the country around that time, according to archaeological work, is the city of Viriconium. And the man who ruled from there was actually known as Arth, which could very easily have turned into more lyrical sounding Arthur. So I think we actually, have, for the first time, located the man behind the legend. How wealthy would have Owen Fant Gwyn been? It, it wouldn't. It, it's more a matter of how much loyalty he um, he commanded. If we look at one of the only things to tell us anything about him as an historical figure, um, which was in the work of Nennius. Um, unfortunately, Gildas, although he refers to him and says he was a, a you know a pretty uh, okay guy and that he was um, you know a good warrior, he doesn't really tell us much about you know, the battles he fought and so forth. But Nennius does tell us about Arthur's battles. Um, but he tell, he refers to him. He doesn't call him a king. He refer, refers to him 
as um, the leader of battles and, and that he led the British kings. In other words, he seems to have basically been a sort of generalissimo, uh, a commander in chief of the British forces. Now, at the time, Britain was divided into lots of separate kingdoms and somebody had to bring them all together to fight. And so it wasn't so much that this man was a character of great wealth, although he must have had some considerable wealth to build a a, a pretty impressive um, Roman style villa, if you like, which was his palace in Viriconium. Um, but it seems to have been more his military expertise or his ability to command the, the respect and loyalty of people that was most important. But one thing you must realize is that although the King Arthur we have in our imagination today was this knight in shining armor living in a huge gothic castle that wouldn't have been what the historical figure would have been like the reason why arthur is portrayed in this medieval sense is that writers during the middle ages tended to set ancient stories in their own historical context if you ever see paintings of the middle from the middle ages of the crucifixion for example you will see that the Roman soldiers are kind of dressed in armor of the medieval period because these guys had no idea what Romans would have looked like. So they just placed it in their own historical context. And the same is so of Arthur. They knew there was this guy who lived many hundreds of years before, and they therefore assumed he must have been dressed like warriors of their day in the 11 or 1200s. In fact, the historical period when Arthur lived, uh, warriors would have been more dressed more like Roman warriors. They would have dressed in Roman style armor and they wouldn't have lived in huge Gothic castles, but their fortifications would have been earthen embankments and wooden stockades. So the actual person that we're talking about wouldn't have been a man in golden armor with a great shining sword. Um, no, he would have been more like a Roman character living in fairly... Not nothing like the kind of spectacular idea we have of Camelot. Is there a record of where Owen Thant Gwynn was buried? Unfortunately, there's no actual historical record telling us that Owen Thant Gwynn was buried in such and such a location. But there was a poem written by a Welsh princess called Heleth around the year 650. So they're talking about, you know, over 100 years after Arthur's time. But she wrote uh, what had happened at that time is that by then the Anglo-Saxons had invaded most of Britain. But Viriconium was still in the hands of the native Britons. They were eventually driven out around 650, in fact, 657 in a battle that the Britons lost and they were pushed into Wales. And it's their descendants who are the Welsh today, which is why they speak a different language to the rest of us English who are descended from the Anglo-Saxons. So I'm not even a native Briton. I'm an Anglo-Saxon speaking English, which was what developed from the Anglo-Saxon language. The people in the west of the country in Wales speak Welsh, which descended from Brythonic, the language that an historical Arthur would have spoken. Now, when the last of the Britons was pushed out of central England and into the mountains of Wales, which the Anglo-Saxons never in, never took over, um, the last king to rule from Viriconium was killed. Now, his name was Kunthalin, and he was buried. And when he was buried, his sister, Heleth, before she fled into Wales, wrote, an, um, uh, wrote, wrote a funeral song, a poem. And in this, she, she, she tells us where the kings of Powys were buried. And she mentioned some earlier kings of Powys being buried there, including a character who has to be Owen Than Gwyn. So in from this poem that was written a good few years later, we get an idea of where Owen would have been buried. And she refers to the burial site as the Churches of Bassa. Now, this poem still survives at Bodleian Library at Oxford University. It's written in the original Brythonic, but in modern translation, the burial site is said to be at the churches of Bassa and around about eight or nine miles north of Viriconium. There is still a village today called Bass Church, Bass Church, churches of Bassa. They're so similar. It has to be one in the same place. And just outside the modern village, there is a, um, a hillock, a large hill, which was 
back in the dark ages surrounded completely by water um in more recent years the area has been drained to reclaim farmland and a few lakes still survive but it's now a hillock rather than an island and this seems to have been the original churches of bassa a limited amount of archaeological work has gone on there and what they have determined archaeologists is that the island was surrounded by a, a man-made embankment and moat but what was interesting about it is that the embankment is on the outside of the moat, facing outwards towards what was once the uh, the lake. And that's the opposite way round to the way that you would have it if it was actually for defensive purposes. And besides that, there is also they made a, a causeway, an embankment that went from the island to the shore of the lake. In other words, it wasn't something that was being used for defensive purposes. It must have been built for, shall we say, ceremonial or religious function of some kind. And possibly the reason they built it like that is because it was the graveyard of the kings who had ruled from Viraconium. Now, Owen, we're told in the poem, is specifically buried somewhere that's known as Travail's Acre. And there's only one part of this hillock area which um, does match the description in the poem and that's an area now known as the enclosure it's a separate little island from the main island if you like that was joined to it by a further causeway it's about an acre in size surrounded by an embankment and that is it seems where Owen the historical Arthur if I'm right was finally laid to rest we've all heard that King Arthur is buried at Glastonbury Abbey. Absolutely. That is the traditional site for Arthur's grave. It all comes about because in 1190s, in the 1190s, um, there had been a fire at Glastonbury Abbey in the 1180s, and it had been reduced to rubble, basically. And in the 1190s, the monks were basically excavating the place in the hope of building a new abbey. And while they were doing this, they claimed to have found a grave. And this grave was close to the altar of what had been the abbey before. And in the grave, they found a skeleton of a man and a lead cross was um, apparently found along with this man, with, with this, with this skeleton. And it said upon it in Latin, here lies the renowned King Arthur in the Isle of Avalon. Now, the story was that Arthur was buried in a place called Avalon, um, and that had come about from Geoffrey of Monmouth's time, although perhaps the earlier references didn't actually have him being buried on Avalon. They only had him going there to be cured. Um, however, that's another story. But the thing was that Arthur was associated with Avalon during the, uh, the 12th century. And so they had this cross, this lead cross, that had said, this is King Arthur and this is Avalon. And, of course, Glastonbury, interestingly enough, had been a, an island like like this place at Bass Church. It had been an island. Bones were really big business in the Middle Ages. People who had um, the bones of saints could charge a lot of money for, for someone to come along and, and be close to them. In various churches throughout the country had the bones of saints who people believed that if they were close to them, they could be cured of ills, could be spit in enlightenment. And... Churches were actually named after the saints whose bones they were thought to have, uh, like Judith, Mary, or whoever else. Now, going back to King Arthur, the bones of kings were also considered to be sacred, and people could be cured by being close to them, or they could, again, receive some kind of spiritual um, fulfilment. And when the monks of Glastonbury claimed to have found Arthur's bones and put them on display. It meant that pilgrims from around the country, the medieval version, if you like, of tourists came flocking and they would pay money to be close to these bones. And the money that the, the abbey raised enabled them to build this spectacular new abbey, one of the finest in the country. Now, that in its own right, makes you a little suspicious that the monks would have had an ulterior motive for claiming to have found King Arthur's bones. Now, the first thing that makes me wonder that, um, you know, that there is something a bit fishy about this is because the, the cross is claimed to have said, here lies the renowned King Arthur on the Isle of Avalon. It's like when I'm buried, 
they're not going to say, say something like, here lies the the author Graham Phillips in the town of London. A, everybody would know it was the town of London and B, most people would know I was the author. So basically saying he's the, the famous King Arthur and he's here on Avalon, you wouldn't need to put that on a cross. So that makes it sound a bit suspicious. The Unfortunately, the cross all the bones no longer survived. They were lost during the Reformation when the abbeys were closed down by Henry VIII in this country. So we don't we haven't got them to examine. But there's something else which uh, linguists say is um, suspicious about the cross. It's written in medieval Latin. In other words, the kind of church Latin used during the Middle Ages, not the kind of spoken Latin that would have been used widely in Britain by the um, by the, the ruling elite at the time Arthur is said to have lived. So it's written in the wrong style of Latin. And in fact, they say it differs from a uh, 5th century form of Latin as much as, say, modern English um, differs from a Shakespearean script. So it's 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 not written in the right form of Latin to be old enough. But the final thing, as far as I'm concerned, to make it out, make out as far as I'm concerned that it was a hoax by the monks is that before they claimed to have found Arthur's bones the monks firstly while they were digging around in the uh, ruins of the old abbey after it had burnt down claimed to have found the bones of St Patrick now St Patrick was a big famous saint in Britain particularly in Ireland well Suddenly, the Irish Christians turned around and said, hold on, you can't have St. Patrick's remains. They're here in Ireland. So they kind of like forgot about that one. Then they claimed to have had bones of the um, a, a saint from England called St. Dunstan, who was once the Archbishop of Canterbury. Now, Canterbury is in the southeast of England. And the Archbishop of Britain at the time, of England at the time, turned around and said, you can't have his remains because uh, St. Dunstan's remains are here on display at Canterbury Cathedral. So they had to sort of like give up on that one. Then they came up with the idea that they'd found Arthur's bones and no one sort of made a fuss about that. So there's so many things that make out the Glastonbury tomb is a medieval hoax. Um, I really don't think it deserves very much more um, historical investigation. But you believe that you have found the real remains, the actual remains of King Arthur. Uh, how exactly were you able to pinpoint the location and what techniques did you use to find the remains of King Arthur, the potential remains? Well, we, we found, based on this poem written by the princess that's in the Oxford's Bodleian Library, we were able to determine that it's at this place called now Bath Church, just outside the village, in a, a hill now called the Birth. Um, and the specific acre of land that matched the descriptions that were given in this poem as to where Owen was. So what I was able to do was to get a, a group of archaeologists with geophysics equipment, and that is uh, scientific equipment that can look under the ground without the need to dig. For example, they'll use something called ground penetrating radar, which provides a computer generated image of what lies in the soil. And they were able to scan this whole area and right in the middle of this acre of ground, they discovered evidence that there had been a, um, a grave dug there. Now, the geophysics equipment can tell when soil has been dug out and then replaced. And what they found was in the centre of this, this area, there was a six foot pit, a circular pit about six foot wide, which totally matched what archaeologists know of graves from the period in question, i.e. about 1500 years ago. High status individuals such as kings were buried in circular pits and they were buried lying on their side very often if they were warriors with a shield on their shoulder. And what the geophysics survey determined was not only that they had a grave matching the kind of grave from the period that Arthur is said to have lived, but they actually found there was a, a ferrous, a, an iron object in the center of the of the pit at the bottom of it, um, which they believe by the shape of it and the size was the boss, the central part of a shield. Now, it seems that, um, they, that the equipment can't tell if there is 
bones down there. The reason being that that the kind of soil it is, the waterlogged uh, conditions of the soil means that the bones themselves would have greatly um, deteriorated over the years so that they can be they ca can be seen if you dig down to them, but very, very carefully. But they can't be de detected by the kind of equipment they have yet. But the nearest that you could possibly get to proof that the Owen Van Gwyn, the man who I believe was Arthur, was buried right in the centre of this um, of this of this, um, this this area of ground is that there is a grave that there appears to be what is a grave matching the sort of thing that you'd expect from that period of time. And there is what appears to be a shield buried there as well. So it does seem to be the grave of an important post Roman chieftain. And because it is exactly in the place that the poem says that Owen's buried, then it is my belief that that is the grave of the historical King Arthur. As far as archaeology goes, are these typical methods used, or are you doing things in an unusual way that uh, the quote-unquote you know, established archaeological method would use? I'm doing it exactly the way an established archaeological method would use. The person who oversaw the uh, geophysics survey was the head archaeologist for the whole of that area in Britain. And, and the archaeologists involved in doing the research are some of the top people in Britain. Um, so it's being done exactly according to the books. I've not gone over there with a spade and tried to dig it up myself. I've got involved the archaeologists and they are convinced that there is a grave of an important figure from the period around 500 AD at that site. They can't, they don't know for certain until they do a dig, but they are convinced that that is what it looks like at this stage. Now, what we need to do next is to organize an actual archaeological dig. That is the only way to know for absolutely certain. But the problem is that the the area of land is has a preservation order on it. Uh, it's known to be a site of historical interest because of the limited amount of archaeology that's gone on there before. So what happens is a department of the British government called English Heritage um, decide that no one can dig there without special permission. Even the person who owns the land can't do it. Now, the, the guy who owns the land was quite happy to have an archaeological dig. The archaeologists wanted to do it. They're not say, I'm not saying that they believe that, my, that, that Owen was Arthur, but they were pretty certain that this post-Roman um, warlord was buried there. So, OK, they may not believe or at least accept my argument that he was Arthur, but they are convinced that there is something there worth digging for. In other words, a, a, um, a post-Roman warrior of high status. Um, and so they wanted to dig. They wanted to do it. The guy whose land it was on was, was OK with it. The, the money was there for the dig. But English heritage basically just turned around and said no. Now, that isn't because they were particularly frightened about um, King Arthur. What they do is they tend to say no all the time now to archaeological digs at protected sites. The reason being that geophysics and other scientific techniques like that are improving year by year. And it is generally thought that perhaps in 10 years time, there won't be any need for archaeological digs in many places because they'll be able to produce an, an actual three dimensional computer generated image of what lies under the ground. They can determine everything without having to actually dig anything up. And considering most things that are dug up by archaeologists are jewels or gold, or or museum, it's just burned and frank pottery. Uh, of course, once it's dug up, everything that you want to know about it can only cannot be determined again with with new techniques. So they don't really want to dig because they believe that in a few years time there won't be a need to dig. Uh, and unless a place is threatened by um, some sort of building work or a new highway is being put through or something like that, they tend to say no. Now, they've said no about this dig, but I'm really pushing them because and some of the archaeologists, because now that I've written this book, I kept I kept the location secret for a long time. But I thought when I wrote this book that English heritage were going to agree to the dig because at first it looked like they were going to. So I've told the world and his wife where this place is. 
And it's only going to take some joker to go over there with a spade and start digging the thing up. And the whole thing's ruined because it's no point digging down there. There's no gold down there. And an ordinary person probably wouldn't be able to tell what they were looking at. A piece of rusted metal and, and, and some outline that looks like a skeleton. So there's nothing there worth digging for. But all some joker needs to do is go over there and dig it up. And the whole thing's ruined. So the archaeologists are saying to English Heritage, please, 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 we need that dig. So I'm hoping it's going to happen very, very soon. We have an audience contributed question here. Historian Tim Clarkson identifies Camelot in the ancient kingdom of Strathclyde. And Merlin is from the same region. They wonder if you've read the same evidence, and if so, what is your opinion? Well, there has been, that's in the north of Britain, and there has been, um, there have been two main con- people's, uh, two kind of camps, if you like, of historians who believe that Arthur may have come from the Glastonbury area, which I've already explained why I don't think he came from down there, or that he may have come from the north of England. Now, so it's not a new, theory but um people have suggested before arthur came from the north of britain the reason i completely dismiss this apart from anything to do with what i found out about owen is because the the whole theory of arthur coming from the north of britain is based on the fact that nennius describes one of arthur's battles as taking place in the north of britain that's it. That's it. It calls it the Battle of the Caledonian Wood and Caledonia was the Roman name of Scotland. So it's right up in the north. But Nennius also mentions battles that Arthur fought in the east of the country and in the south and in the west. He was fighting all over the place because, as Nennius says, he was the leader of battles for the British kings. He was their their general, if you like, their commander in chief. And he was fighting all over the country dispelling not only the Anglo-Saxons in the east, but the Picts who came from Scotland in the north and Irish raiders who came across the Irish Sea from Ireland were invading in the west. So he would have been fighting all over the place. So the fact that one of the battles was in the north of Britain doesn't really prove that he came from the north. The other piece of evidence that those who believe he came from the north cite is that the earliest reference to Arthur, dating from about 600, that still survives, actually saying the name Arthur, is a poem about uh, a battle that took place in the north of England around 600. And a warrior in that battle is described as brave, but he's described as he was no Arthur. Although he was a brave soul, he is no Arthur. Now, that's that, that there is seemingly a reference to our famous King Arthur. But just because a person fighting in the north of Britain is likened unto, well, at least he's said not to be good, as good as Arthur, uh, uh, that, that he's actually compared to Arthur doesn't mean that Arthur actually came from there. It just means that his fame had spread to the to, to the north of Britain. And in fact, the, the fame of King Arthur seems to have spread all the way down to Italy, because in Italy, there is actually an, one of the earliest references to Arthur is found um, inscribed on an arch that was built in the uh, in the medieval period. Um, and no one suggesting Arthur came from Italy, only that his fame had spread wildly, uh, widely. So I don't think that there is any evidence that Arthur came from the north of Britain um, any more than it's anywhere else in those in that particular poem or in Nennius's descriptions of Arthur's battles. Another audience question. What are your thoughts on Artorius Dux Ballorum? Well, Dux Ballorum is the Latin for leader of battles. Now, Nennius describes Arthur as the leader of battles. And I've already explained that one, um, that he was, uh, although, he, you know, he, he was maybe just a king of a certain area of Britain. He was accepted as the overall leader of the Britons. That's what leader of battles Dux Ballorum means. The name Artorius isn't mentioned by um, by Nennius. Uh, certain people in more in more modern times have suggested that the name Arthur derived from a Roman name Artorius. And the historical records of a couple of Roman soldiers that were here who had the name Artorius. They were before Arthur's time. They're not the same figure as uh, was obviously united the Britons around 500 AD, but they've said, well, the name Arthur could come from the word Arturius. Well, I think it's far more likely now, from what I've discovered, 
that the name Arthur came from the word Arth, meaning bear. I think it's just a coincidence that the name Arturius sounds a bit like it. It's far more likely that it came from the actual Brythonic word for a bear. You also searched for Arthur's famous sword, Excalibur. Uh, Before we cover it, was Excalibur the same sword drawn from the stone? That's a very good question. Most people just assume it is. Uh, No, it isn't the same. Um, In the story of King Arthur um, that was written in the medieval period, Arthur first proves himself king by drawing a sword from a stone. That is a completely... What happens to that sword afterwards, we're not told. Arthur receives Excalibur from a mysterious nymph-like creature called the Lady of the Lake. Merlin takes him to receive it, and she, she comes out of the lake and gives it to him. Now, that's Excalibur, the sword that's supposed to make Arthur invincible. Now, the Excalibur story was something that I thought would be the most unlikely part of the Arthurian saga to have any kind of historical um, basis to it. Uh, Because, you know, the idea of I mean, the story is that when Arthur lies dying on the field of battle after his final conflict, uh, he asks one of his knights, Bedivere, to throw the sword, throw his sword Excalibur into a nearby lake. And when Excalibur throws the sword, the arm of the Lady of the Lake comes from the surface of the water, grabs the weapon by the hilt and takes it down into the watery depths. Now, that just sounds like a completely made up thing, along with dragons and damsels in distress. But what's fascinating is that at the time that Arthur is said to have lived, 500 AD, there was a practice amongst the Britons, the Celtic Britons, that during a funeral of an important person, particularly a warrior, their sword would be thrown into a sacred pool or lake as an offering to a water spirit, a water goddess. And it's possibly from this that the idea of throwing it to a a physical water nymph came about. What's fascinating is that although the Britons were nominally Christian at this time, they carried on with a number of Uh, of ancient pagan practices and one of those was this sword throwing tradition and basically what had been once a water goddess became known as a uh, a water saint um, a saint associated with the water and the name of this original water goddess was the, the british water goddess that they threw the swords to was viviana And the name given to the Lady of the Lake in the Middle Ages is Vivian. So I really do think that this it's it's pretty certain that the the story of Arthur's sword being thrown to the Lady of the Lake came about because of an actual funeral practice. Now, if Arthur was buried at uh, Bass Church, as I believe, in this 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 mound that was, you know, this hillock, which was an island, then perhaps somewhere in the lake surrounding that island is where his sword was thrown. So I managed to organize another uh, archaeological survey, this time a geophysics marine archaeological survey in which one of the lakes that still survives around the the what was the island um, known as Birth Pool. We got a, uh, a, a marine archaeologist with all sorts of equipment on the boat, literally went up and down the lake, scanning the bottom to see if there was anything there. Now, I was able to tell them what they might be looking for, because there's a very old description of Arthur's sword Excalibur in, uh, that still survives at the Bodleian Library in Oxford in a book um, called The Red Book of Hergist. And in this story, in, 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 in an account in, in this book, Um, Arthur's sword is described as having a golden hilt comprised of two intertwined serpents or dragons. Um, So we know we're looking for a golden hilt to sword. Now, even if the actual iron or steel of which the main part of the sword, the blade was made, had rotted away, you know, had um, had rusted away over the years, gold wouldn't. So a large gold object might still be at the bottom of the lake so they scan the whole thing and the, the, what they determined was that there did seem to be something about the size of a sword hilt that could be made of gold 
at the bottom of the lake. Now, the reason they couldn't be sure is because the whole of the bottom of the lake is covered in mud and they had to send divers down to see what was there. But sadly, when the divers emerged, they said, look, it, there's about four feet of mud at the bottom of this lake before you even get to the bed. We can't even get down to it. And the, air, the, 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 the water is so um, peat stained, you can't see, you know, hand in front of your face. So at the moment, we don't know what's down there. There has to, unless we had dredged the entire place, we're just not going to know. But if one was able to actually dig up from the bottom of that lake a sword hilt, which was made of gold with two intertwined serpents on it, then that's a pretty good piece of evidence that we've actually found the historical Excalibur. Your description of the sword, you know, that's a precious sword. That would be an incredible value. But yet when you talked about Viraconium earlier, uh, you're saying that the soldiers actually had, did not have gold-plated armor and such. So why were you looking for an Excalibur that would be golden and have the hilt and, and such? Well, although the way that they lived would have been more simple than the way that knights, if you like, lived in the Middle Ages. When it came to items that denoted royalty, no expense was spared. They would have things made from gold. Now, whereas in the Middle Ages, a king was um, a king's symbol of office was his crown. The symbol of office for a medieval chieftain was their sword. And so if they could get hold of, of gold, they would certainly make sure that the gold went onto a sword. Now, other swords with golden hilts have been found throughout Europe uh, from this period, from the Celtic people of Europe, of which the Britons were one. So um, this wasn't unusual in its own right. Um, not many have been found, and you're absolutely right, it would be pretty much priceless. The legend of the two dragons... In Welsh legend, the white dragon represents the Saxons, uh, while the red dragon represents Wales. This sounds very much like the serpent intertwined on the hilt of Excalibur. Yes, it seems that this legend probably came about because originally the Roman legion that was stationed at Viraconium, that is the place where I believe the historical Arthur was based, they, their symbol was two serpents intertwined. Um, it was emblazoned on their, um, the Roman armor, or it was put on their, um, standard. And it seems that this sword probably originally, or the idea of the two serpents on the sword was that it represented whoever it was who was considered to be in charge of the soldiers based at Viraconium. It was an old Roman tradition that had carried on. And it probably means that the historical Arthur, Owen Thanguin, used Roman tactics on used a Roman style army to beat the Anglo-Saxons. There's a Norse legend called Barnstoker, where Odin thrusts a sword into the trunk of a tree and challenges anyone to remove it. Sounds a lot like the sword in the stone myth. Uh, is that possibly where it derived from? It is possible. I, I think, this, as I say, the sword in the stone myth um, could have been something that was attached onto the Arthurian story. As it gradually developed through the Middle Ages, more and more myths and legends were added on, sometimes from other stories entirely. For example, the story of the round table. Um, it was historically recorded that the, f the first Holy Roman Emperor, that was the king of the Franks, a man by the name of Charlemagne during the Dark Ages, had a round table made and all of his warriors would sit around it. Um, and the idea was that no one would be seated um, at the head of the table. So everyone was equal. Now, that idea was clearly, therefore, stolen by the Arthurian romant romancers in the Middle Ages, specifically a man called Wace, who came from the island of Jersey off the south of Britain. And he brought in a completely separate story of a round table and added it in to the story of King Arthur. And something very similar may have been done by somebody who'd already known about the Norse legend, just changing the tree to a stone. As I understand, you have a plan B of sorts. Uh, 
uh, should the site at the birth fail to produce the results you're looking for. And this lies in birch grove and a limestone slab. Yeah, just on on the on the um, firstly, just explaining what would happen in, at a burial fifteen hundred years ago. It wasn't a tradition then to actually place the gravestone on top of the grave. It would normally be placed in a chapel somewhere nearby. This is known from exa- for example, we know f- Gildas mentions a king of South Wales who was a contemporary of Owen and his name was Vortiporex. Now, his gravestone has been found, but it wasn't found where he was buried. It was found what in a place which was a small a nearby chapel. So the person's gravestone, or at least their memorial stone, will be placed in a nearby chapel. So if we can't dig up the actual grave and find out somehow from that that we have got an historical author, then maybe we can find something else at a nearby chapel. Now, we know from the records that a chapel did stand on the banks of what had been the lake that surrounded the, 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 the burial site. And this is known as Birch Grove, the area that it's a, a little promontory, a little spur that goes out into the lake of higher ground. And the chapel once stood there. It was actually, and sadly, the remains of the chapel were fi- finally flattened in the 1920s when a road was put there. But um, the, 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 the foundation stones still survive under the road. And what's interesting is this was known as Birch Grove. Now, in the legend of King Arthur, Arthur's knight Bedivere is the one who not only throws his sword to the Lady of the Lake, but shortly afterwards, he, uh, in the story that was written by um, William, uh, sorry, was written by um, Thomas Mallory in the 1400s, he tells us that eventually at a chapel where Arthur is buried, beside the lake, in other words, Arthur only goes to Avalon, the island, in order for his wounds to be tended. And when he dies, he's brought back to shore and buried beside the lake in that story. He's buried in a little chapel in which Bedivere spends the rest of his life as a guardian. He becomes a hermit and lives in this chapel, guarding the grave of Arthur. Now, I'm I'm not saying that's real. That's obviously just a legend. But what's interesting is the name Bedivere in the earliest of the Arthurian stories. Bedivere, his name is pronounced Bedwyr. And Bedwyr in Welsh comes from a word meaning birch tree. And this is known as Birch Grove, where the actual chapel stood. So it may be because of this confusion with names of a birch, Bedwyr, and the name of Bedwyr that comes Bedivere, that the legend came about. It may have been that Arthur never had a, um, a knight called Bedivere at all. It's simply because a chapel stood at Bedwyr's Grove or Birch Grove, as it's now known. That's only a, a possibility, but certainly the nearest old chapel that would have stood near where I believe Owen was buried is at this particular site. And I would absolutely love to have that um, excavated because it's possible that some of the gravestones or at least memorial stones still survive in the rubble amongst the uh, amongst the foundations. And in fact, one of the foundation stones has been removed not too long ago and is now at the museum at nearby town of Shrewsbury. And it basically is a memorial stone because it has the word hic on it, which H-I-C, which is the Latin for here, as in here lies somebody or other. And according to the Arthurian legend on Arthur's um, memorial stone was written here lies Arthur, the once and future king. Well, maybe that's true. Maybe that was made up in the medieval period. But it would be great to actually see if there is some memorial stone that lies under what's now that road to reveal that Arthur is buried nearby, or at least even if it reveals Owen was buried nearby, that's good enough for me. So King Arthur isn't necessarily buried underneath the chapel. It could just be a marker. Precisely. So in other words, there's these two separate places. I mean, it's possible that, that I mean, it's I, I, whatever, it's, we won't know what's there until we actually, I think it's worth 
having that road closed down for a few weeks and have somebody dig the place up. I mean, stranger things have happened than finding King Arthur or at least something to do with him buried under a road. I mean, Richard III, his body was found, you know, his skeleton was found not too long ago underneath a car park. Uh, That's true. Yeah, and I think the fascinating thing, what's absolutely fascinating about that car park is that the the lady who actually did all the research wasn't an archaeologist or an historian. She was an amateur. She'd put all this stuff together and said to the archaeologist, I believe that King Richard III, we know one knows where he's buried. I think he's underneath this car park in the middle of this town called Leicester. And they said, oh, no, he's not under a car park. And what made them really suspicious was that certain letters were written on the car park denoting where people um, were allowed to park, you know. There was a Z somewhere and an R somewhere else. And the letter R happened to be right over where she said Richard was buried. So everyone thought, no way. But when they dug underneath this letter R, removed the tarmac, dug down, they found the grave of Richard III. His bones are now in in the nearby cathedral. And people flock from all over the world just to go to where these bones are. I mean, there's queues all the way around the block all the year round. So stranger things have happened. Of the two discoveries, King Arthur's tomb and Excalibur, of the two, which would you prefer to find conclusively? Well, I'd love to find this this wonderful um, hilt of a sword, 1,500 years old or maybe older, with two serpents entwined and this golden hilt. That would certainly be worth a fortune. But... From an archaeological perspective, from an historian's perspective, actually finding evidence that the person who is buried in this grave is not only Owen, but was the person who was thought to be, who was given the name Arthur or Arth in his lifetime. If it said something like, I mean, the thing is, if I find the, a gravestone that says Owen Thangwin is buried here, it's not going to convince the sceptic that this man was the one and the same as Arthur. I've still got to say, look, he was known as Arthur, yeah, but that's not Arthur. But if I could find something inscribed that actually said, not only was this man Owen, but he was known as Arthur or something like that during his lifetime, that would be absolutely fantastic. So I think of the two, it has to be the grave. As we said earlier, Excalibur must be priceless if it exists at all if you were to find it and and indeed it is excalibur who owns it gold and silver wherever it's found in this country is what they call treasure trove it belongs to the crown the queen in other words the government um so in other words it's then put into a uh, a museum like the british museum or probably would be where it would end up the finder does actually get a commission but the thing is that the person whose land it's on also gets a commission. So if I was to say, I believe it's there, they dug it up and it would mean that the, the I don't know how it works out. I wouldn't get very much. So uh, it's not going to make me a millionaire if it's found. The government get the vast majority of it. Um, but that's not really what I'm, I mean. I'm too old to be bothered about money. What I'm bothered about is making before I croak, before I die, I'd love to actually have some real, real strong, absolute positive evidence that my theory is right. Then you wouldn't get people claiming he comes from up north. Yeah. How many years have you been looking into this now? Twenty five. <laughs> if I, I, I just I, I just hope that this dig takes place before, you know, before too much longer. I mean, I'm 63 now. I mean, maybe I'll live for another 20 or 30 years. Are you forcing evidence and and pieces to fit or are you more skeptic than ever? When I started, my intention was to basically rubbish the King Arthur legend because my original book was going to be basically just a common sense look at some of these mad legends that exist in Britain, like Robin Hood, King Arthur. St. George, who was supposedly slayed a dragon. And I, and people were going around the country saying, oh, yeah, King Arthur was here. And people in Glastonbury were making a fortune out of it. And I just basically wanted to debunk the whole thing for a bit of fun, I think, more than anything else, going back 25 years. And I already knew that there was not a lot of evidence connecting Arthur with Glastonbury. So I looked into it and I found what I just 
talked about earlier about the fact that the monks seem to have just hoaxed the whole thing. So it started off as a debunking book. But then as I looked more into it, I, be, I thought, well, OK, let's just let's just say if Arthur didn't come from Glastonbury and that wasn't his Camelot, where was it then? And I looked into this northern Arthur idea. And as I said, there didn't seem to be much behind it because, um, you know, Nennius hadn't really. I mean, he got Arthur fighting all over the place. So that took away the northern idea. But then when I started to find evidence that Arthur may have not have come from any of those places, but from the centre of Britain, which nobody else seemed to have concentrated on, um, I began to become more fascinated by it. And the more I tried to debunk it, the more I seemed to be drawn towards an historical figure from the archaeological point of view and the historical records, not some myths and legends that developed in the Middle Ages. If you were a betting man, how confident are you that you've discovered the remains of King Arthur? I would say 99% convinced. I'm not at 100% convinced until we actually dig the thing up. But I mean, if you look at the whole evidence that the whole the train, the trail of clues, if you like, historical clues, I've looked at a place that archaeology has confirmed was the most sophisticated city in the country when Arthur is said to have ruled from the most sophisticated city. So that's the archaeological evidence. I've looked at primary source material in Oxford University and the British Library, which tells us that we have a man whose name was Arth that ruled at that time from this place that archaeologists say is the um, is the most sophisticated city in the country. And that that's this person built this this um palace there if you like so okay that's pretty good but really when i then find out that owen had a father who was known as the and his um epithet epithet if you like was the terrible head dragon and if you translate terrible head dragon into brythonic the language spoken in arthur's time terrible head dragon translates as uther pen dragon and Arthur's father is said to have been called Uther Pendragon. I can't see what other kind of proof you need. Where do we stand, Graham? What are things like going forward? The next thing I'm going to do is to... It's, there's got to be a dig that takes place at the site where I think Arthur's buried. Everybody wants to do it for whatever their reasons. They may not accept my Arthur hypothesis, but they want to do the dig. The archaeologists want to do it. They've got the money to do it. The landowner says we can do it. So that dig has got to go ahead. All English heritage needs to know now is that if they don't say we can do the dig, some joker with a spade's going to go and wreck the thing. And this is, in fact, the very moment the Christmas celebrations are over, I am going down to London. I'm going to the head office of English heritage with a group of archaeologists, and we're going to present this to them and say, if you don't do the dig, you're wasting a fantastic opportunity for an archaeological excavation of a British king from this period. And to be quite honest, no British king from that period's body has yet been discovered intact. So, you know, no grave from that period of a British king has been found. So even if you don't agree with Arthur, You've got to accept that this is a major archaeological uh, opportunity and it'll be lost if this dig doesn't take place. So I'm hoping that very soon in the new year this will be going on. And I, and I intend to actually record it bit as it's going on day after day and putting all the information up on my Facebook and website film and everything of this actually going on. And so the moment that uh, we have got the absolute proof from for I might, that my theory is right, or that if I'm proved completely wrong, it's going to be up there for everyone to see. If you aren't given the permission, will you just say to heck with it and just do it yourself? No, because there's no point. I mean, archaeologists won't do the dig without permission because they'd get struck off or whatever happens to archaeologists that do things without permission. But without archaeologists, no one would, if you just dig it up, we, don't, we won't know what's down there because the bones won't be like bones. They'll be like discolored um, markings in the soil that look like a skeleton. And you, they have to dig very, very carefully. And then they have to spray what's there with special preservative materials so that the 
that what are bones basically who just look like outlines in the soil remain intact and to discover for example what was once on the shield which would have been made out of wood and then painted over the outline of that can still be seen in the soil and that can only be done with proper archaeological techniques by experts not by somebody with a spade that would just ruin it you wouldn't know what was there they just find a uh, uh, some you know some different colored soil and some perhaps a piece of metal and, and that's it they wouldn't know what it was but i'm hoping that the archaeologists may be able to tell what was on the shield because what's interesting is that nennius tells us that arthur actually had an image of the virgin mary painted on his shield if that was found to be there by archaeological techniques that would go a long way towards showing that this was the historical arthur the book is The Lost Tomb of King Arthur. It's the first book that Graham Phillips has done in a long time. Why has it been so long, Graham? Well, it was seven years ago that I did the last book. The reason being is that, well, I've been concentrating on two or three different things all at the same time. Um, I'm also doing a, uh, more research into what happened to the Ark of the Covenant, which um, was the golden chest that was supposed to contain the Ten Commandments. I've been doing more research into the story of the Holy Grail. So I've been doing all this for the last seven years, and I kind of got so involved in this stuff that I'm really not that interested in writing books anymore. I just want to get involved in doing the research. But the reason I did put this book together is that I thought there was going to be an archaeological dig take place. So I thought, OK, I'll put the Arthur book together and explain the whole thing. And hopefully the book will come out at the same time as whenever they found whatever they're doing when they're doing the dig. But of course, as I said, that didn't happen. So it's kind of not really intended that I was going to do a book now. But now I've got back into doing books, so I suppose I'll carry on. Um, and... I don't know what my next one's going to be yet. It depends what I find. Well, uh, your books get an incredible amount of interest. Always uh, a big deal when they come out. Your website, GrahamPhillips.net, it has a lot of stuff on there. Uh, we haven't sold the farm, though. There is so much more in the book. So to the audience, don't feel like you've heard everything that's uh, in the book. There's a heck of a lot more. How does my audience interact with you, Graham? Well, if you go onto my website, grahamphillips.net, if you just type Graham Phillips into Google, you'll find me. There's only other, one other famous Graham Phillips, and he's an actor in America who was in Ben 10. And I'm clearly not him. So if you just put Graham Phillips author, you'll find my website, if you forget the, the, the uh, domain. On the front page, there's all pictures of all the covers of my books. Just click on the relevant one, in this case, King Arthur. Uh, the, the Lost Tomb of King Arthur, and it will take you into all the, you know, the, the various pages that are there that explain what I've been talking about with pictures. But also on that front page, you'll see a link to my web, uh, to my Facebook, uh, which is Graham Phillips author, again, to distinguish me from any other Graham Phillips that's out there. Um, and I'll be happy for anyone to join my uh, Facebook and any new stuff goes up there. If there's any new news, can you come back and share that with my audience? I'd absolutely love to. Okay. Graham Phillips, always the greatest conversations. Graham Phillips, thank you so much for being a guest on the program. Thank you very much for having me.